What's up, everyone? Welcome to Here in Apologetics, wherever you're joining us and wherever, however you may be. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Uh, today, we got a really exciting debate lined up. We have Hayden Clark from Help Me Believe. Uh, Help Me Believe exists to strengthen the faith of the believer and answer the question of the critic. Uh, we do this by creating apologetic. He does this through creating apologetic and theology material that answers common questions about the Christian faith. Hayden has a really cool channel where he talks with a lot of smart people about questions relating to God and Christianity. I encourage you to check that out. And we also have John Gleason, the godless engineer, who is a popular YouTube atheist who is an ex-Christian and looks a lot, mostly the claims of Christians, but also some other people. And he's a really cool channel, nearing 50,000 subscribers. So congratulations to John for that. Um, welcome, guys. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, ha had, a, had a pretty good couple of weeks as far as the channel goes. So, you know, I'm doing all right. Yeah, yeah it's good to be here. Uh, thanks uh, for having me. It's good to see John again. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, man, it's great to have both you guys. So the thesis that's going to be debated today is, did Paul believe in a historical Jesus? Hayden is going to take the affirmative while John is not. Of course, um, a historical Jesus in this debate is being understood in terms of a Jesus who was, quote, walking the face of the earth and was crucified on the earth around 30 CE. Um, Hayden is going to defend the affirmative using only Paul's genuine letters. Uh, the format for the debate, we're going to have 15-minute opening statements, 10-minute rebuttals, 5-minute closings, and then we're going to have a Q&A. So if you have questions as we go, be sure to put them in the live chat. And Nate2D2 is lurking around, and he will DM me, and we will hopefully get to all or most of the questions um, throughout the debate. So... With that being said, I don't think I missed anything. Uh, we're going to turn it to Hayden. He's going to give his op opening statement whenever you're ready. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I want to say thank you to Zach for hosting this debate, and thanks to John for agreeing to this debate. Uh, it's good to see you again, my friend. And before beginning, I want to give a special thanks uh, to my friends Nick Quint and Jonathan Depew for helping me uh, formulate my argument, your input, and even more so your friendship. Uh, it means a lot to me. And I'd also like to give credit where it is due on the topic of the historical Jesus in contrast with Jesus mythicism. I am indebted in no small part to two non-Christians. That would be Dr. Bart Ehrman and Tim O'Neill. So again, that's two non-Christians who have argued thoroughly for the historicity of Jesus. Now the question before us is, did Paul believe in a historical Jesus? I'm taking the word historical to mean human, fleshly, walk the earth, uh, etc., as opposed to merely a celestial or angelic Jesus. So I will argue in the affirmative that not only did Paul believe in a historical Jesus, but that he obviously did so. And this obviousness is testified to by the fact that this debate largely takes place online between non-scholars like John and myself, and that this debate does not take place in the academy. And so like my Baptist uh, forefathers before me, I will argue three points. The first one will be that Paul believed Jesus was a biological descendant of David. And Paul believed Jesus, uh, the second one is Paul believed Jesus had a biological brother, James. And the third one will be that Paul believed Jesus to have suffered crucifixion uh, here on the earth. And so first, Paul believed Jesus was a biological descendant of David. As my, main, as my main text, I'll take Romans 1, verses 1 through 4, which reads, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, uh, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised previously through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared son of God in power, according to the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection of the dead uh, of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the question is, what does Paul mean by born, quote, born a descendant of David according to the flesh? Now, the word born simply means to become. When it's used in conjunction with according to the flesh, it clearly means human birth like it does in Romans 9-11 in reference to the children of Rebekah. Paul clearly believes Jesus to be, quote, a descendant of David, but in what sense? Well, we don't have to wonder or theorize because he tells us. It, a, quote, according to the flesh. So what does it mean to be, quote, a, a descendant according to the flesh? Likewise, we don't have to guess because Paul tells us. Addressing his Jewish audience in Romans 4, 1, Paul asks, what then shall we say that Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh, has found? Paul also boldly states in Romans 9, 3 through 4, for I could wish myself to be accursed from Christ, from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my fellow countrymen, quote, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Most significantly for our purposes, in the verses following in Romans 9, 5, Paul says, quote, to whom, that is the Israelites, belong the patriarchs, and from whom is the Christ, according to human descent, 
who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And then Paul gives us the hermeneutical key to understanding without mistake exactly what he means by all of this in Romans 9, verses 6 through 8 which says, but it is not as if the word of God had failed, for not all those who are descended from Israel are truly Israel, nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham. But, quote, in Isaac will your descendants be named. That is, it is not the children by human descent who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as descendants, end quote. Paul is making it abundantly clear that the Gentiles who respond to Jesus faithfully are considered descendants of Abraham because of their faith, even though, unlike the Jews, they are not biological descendants. He makes the same point in Galatians 3 and 4, which says, And if you are Christ's, then you are descendants of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. That's Galatians 3.29. In Galatians 4, Paul makes an allegory of Abraham's children, which says, Quote, but the one by the female slave was born according to human descent, and the one by the free woman through the, through the promise, Galatians 4.23. His point is made again in, in, in chapter 4, verses 28 through 29 in Galatians, which reads, But you, brothers, are children of the promise, just as Isaac. But just as at that time the child born according to human descent persecuted the child born according to the Spirit, so also now. So the point he's making is that the children born according to human descent, that is, Jews who have Abraham as their ancestor, are persecuting the children of the promise, which is both Jews and Gentiles, who have put their faith in Christ, not the law. And so the rule for Paul is clearly seen to be this. Descendant can be understood in a non-biological sense and in a biological sense. When he uses the term in a non-biological sense, he qualifies it with, quote, according to the spirit or, quote, according to the promise. When he uses the term in a biological sense, he qualifies it with according to the flesh or according to human descent. In Romans 1-3, Paul says that Jesus is a descendant of David according to the flesh and a son of God, that is a descendant of God, uh, according to the Holy Spirit. Now, my position is to deny neither. Paul believed Jesus to be a fleshly human descendant of Abraham and David, an Israelite, and also to be a descendant or son of God according to the Spirit. The mythicist must show that Paul only committed to the latter description of Jesus and on those terms specifically. In order to do so, they must show that Paul does not use the term descendant in conjunction with, according to the flesh, to denote human biological ancestry. Again, they must show from the Pauline corpus that Paul does not do this. Appealing to instances outside of the Pauline corpus will be of no benefit, given the fact that Paul has provided a plethora of instances of these two phrases being used in conjunction with one another, as I've just shown. With such a great cloud of examples, we can easily, and I mean easily, ascertain what Paul means by descendant when he uses it in conjunction with according to the flesh. He means human biological ancestry every single time, and thus Paul believed Jesus to be a biological human being. Secondly, Paul believed uh, Jesus to have a biological brother named James. In the opening chapter of Galatians, Paul seeks to chastise the Galatian church for accepting a different gospel than the one that he preached to them originally. In order to do so, he reminds the Galatians that he did not receive his gospel from, quote, flesh and blood or, quote, human origin, but via a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel thus carries the authority of Christ himself. In order to explain how he came about this gospel directly from Jesus and free from any human influence, he says that he did not, quote, consult with flesh and blood immediately, nor did he go to Jerusalem to meet with those apostles who came before him. It wasn't until three years later that he went up to Jerusalem to meet with Cephas, that is Peter, and James, the brother of the Lord. Now, the key verse reads as follows. Quote, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and I stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any others of the apostles except James, the brother of the Lord. Galatians 1, 18 through 19. Now, the question is, in what sense is James, quote, the brother of the Lord? Now, Paul uses the word brother numerous times to mean what we might say fellow Christians, or uh, as I've heard John say before, fictive kinship. He also uses it to denote his fellow non-believing Jews in Romans 9, 3. The same word is translated sister to denote fellow female Christians, like in Romans 16.1 in reference to Phoebe. It is used to denote uh, neurosis. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. This person's female biological sibling in Romans 16.15. 
And a curious case amounts in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, which reads, do we not have the right to take along a sister, that's the first instance, as a wife, like the rest of the apostles and the brothers, that's the second instance, of the Lord and Cephas. The word translated sister obviously does not mean in a biological sense, lest we believe that Paul, a first century Jew, uh, believed taking a biological sister as a wife was permissible, which is clearly false. And so the term brothers of the Lord in this same verse is exactly what is in question, and so I'll return to it momentarily. So Paul uses the term in a biological and a non-biological sense, the overwhelming majority of the time in a non-biological sense. So why is it that the overwhelming majority of Greek exegetes have understood Paul to be saying that Jesus had a biological brother here? In a word, it's the context. In a few more words, as follows. Number one, Paul only uses the phrase brothers of the Lord twice, here in Galatians 1, 18 through 19 and in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. In all the other numerous instances where Paul uses the term brother to reference fellow Christians, he never calls them a brother of the Lord. He only does so here in these two instances, which just so happen to be the two instances in which the majority of Greek exegetes believe he means it in a biologic, biological sense. Secondly, Paul uses this term to distinguish James from Cephas and the rest of the apostles in both instances. If by brother of the Lord, Paul simply meant fellow Christians, this would obviously imply that Cephas and the other apostles are not fellow Christians. Now, if Paul only uses the phrase brother of the Lord in these two instances, and in neither case can it be understood as simply fellow Christian, in what sense does he mean it? Well, if one starts with the conviction that Paul does believe in a historical human earthly Jesus, then there is the obvious. He means it in a biological sense. If one starts with the belief that Paul only believed in a celestial Jesus and not human Jesus, then one must contrive an explanation or submit that one's thesis is wrong. Rather, rather than doing the latter, some, like Dr. Richard Carrier, have contrived the explanation that Paul has in mind, quote, sub-apostolic believers when he says brother of the Lord in reference to James. Now, the problem with this contrived explanation is that it ruins Paul's entire argument in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul begins his argument by saying, am I not an apostle? He answers his own question in verse 2 uh, by saying, if to others I am not an apostle, yet indeed I am to you, for you are my seal of apostleship in the Lord. And so Paul is arguing that he has the same status as the other apostles and as such has a right to the same benefits. If brother of the Lord is a reference to someone that is not an apostle, a sub-apostolic person, his argument completely falls apart and becomes incoherent. Paul is establishing that his apostolic status is the same as those mentioned, namely the other apostles, Cephas and James, the brother of the Lord. So this explanation does not work. As such, brother of the Lord is an appellation attached to the end of James's name to distinguish him, distinguish him from the other apostles. Not in the sense that James is a fellow Christian, as that would exclude Peter and the other apostles from being fellow Christians, but in the only other sense we have available, which is a biological sibling. And so third, uh, Jesus was crucified on earth. In 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8, Paul writes, Now we do speak wisdom among the mature, but wisdom not of this age or of the rulers of this age who are perishing. But we speak the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery which God predestined before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, I maintain that when Paul says crucifixion here, and when the Corinthians heard the word crucifixion, they would both certainly have in mind that common form of Roman execution here on earth and not uh, in outer space or in some celestial realm as mythicists maintain. The idea of a human being being crucified on earth by other humans would be well known to Paul and his Corinthian correspondence. However, the idea of a celestial being uh, being crucified in outer space would have been utterly unheard of. The point of tension, although there is no real tension, comes down to how we should understand the, quote, rulers of this age. Paul uses the same word in Romans 13, 3 to describe the governmental authorities in Rome. In that same context, Paul says, for it, the ruling authorities, is, gov is God's servant to you for what is good. But if you do what is bad, be afraid, because it does not bear the sword for no purpose. For it is God's servant, the one who avenges for punishment on the one who does what is bad. He makes it clear that he means governmental authorities when he commands the Romans to, quote, pay your taxes. And so Paul seems to have grasped the common saying, there's only two things that you can count on for certain, death and taxes, and the government deals in both. And when Paul says that the governmental authorities do not bear the sword for no purpose, he's clearly referencing the death penalty, which is corroborated by his statement that these authorities punish, quote, the one who does what is bad. So for Paul, governmental authorities, which he references as rulers, carry out capital punishment. 
Whether he approves of capital punishment or not is up for debate. What is clear is that in Pauline language, rulers can reference those who carry out capital punishment. Now back to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Paul mentions rulers of this age, which we just saw can mean governmental authorities, in conjunction with crucifixion, which was a known form of capital punishment. Both in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8 and Romans 13, 3, we see the term ruler in conjunction with capital punishment or a form of capital punishment. In Romans 13, 3, the rulers are unmistakably governmental authorities on earth, specifically in Rome. And so the question now becomes, why on earth would we interpret this same conjunction in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8 any differently? Moreover, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 15, Paul says, for you became imitators, uh, brothers uh, of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus, because you also suffered the same things at the hands of your own people, just as they themselves did also at the hands of the Jews, who killed uh, both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and who persecuted us, and who are not pleasing to God, and are opposed to all people. And there's two things to point out here. Uh, briefly, so, some have accused this passage of anti-Semitism. Uh, however, the passage is specifically highlighting the condemnation of that group of Jewish leaders who unjustly per uh, persecute God's anointed, both in the past and in the present. It's not a blanket statement about all Jews everywhere. Secondly, some have tried to say that this passage was a later interpolation. In fact, the mythicists must say that this passage was a later interpolation because it unequivocally states that a group of Jews, obviously on earth, killed Jesus. The problem is that this passage is found in every single manuscript that we have access to, and thus the charge of uh, interpolation is an argument from silence. Thus, here we have an unmistakable reference to Jesus being killed by the Jews. In, conclu in conclusion, we can easily determine that Paul believed that Jesus was crucified at the hands of a group of Jews and ruling governmental authorities. Now, the mythicist case uh, for Paul believing in Jesus' crucifix crucifixion in outer space will ultimately depend on an appeal to texts outside of the Pauline corpus, which have no direct correlation to Paul whatsoever, meaning Paul never quotes them or even hints at having knowledge of them. The mythicists would maintain uh, that Paul's audience would have understood these references to mean crucified in outer space, despite the obvious. And so with these points firmly established uh, in the Pauline corpus, we can arrive decisively at the conclusion that Paul, beyond any reasonable doubt, believed in a historical, earthly, fleshly Jesus. And Paul, writing only 10 to 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion, is an excellent source for historical Jesus studies. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, we're going to turn this to John here. Just before we do that, I just want to say that if you guys have questions as we go, be sure to put them in the live chat and we will get to them at the end. Nate 2 d 2 uh, thank you, Nate, is going to send me all the questions. Uh, but with that, turn it to you, John, whenever you're ready. All right. So uh, first, I want to thank Hayden and uh, for having this debate and uh, with me and Zach for setting it up. I appreciate a good discussion on the topic of the history of the Bible. I don't think there is a definitive answer for today's question. Uh, I lean more towards one answer than the other, but ultimately the only person that truly knows uh, would be Paul. I do believe there is enough evidence to support that he probably didn't consider Jesus to be an earthly figure. I agree that Paul thought that Jesus had a fleshly body, but that doesn't mean that he had existed on earth prior to that. I'm going to show you how vague Paul's statements are surrounding Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, showing that none of them can concretely distinguish Jesus as a historical figure and only establishes his celestial presence. Again, this doesn't mean that he definitely didn't exist in history, just that the evidence doesn't support a definite answer. First, I'm going to firmly establish that Paul does not give any indication that his information about Jesus is based on anything in history. Then I'm going to discuss Paul's theology concerning Jesus as a celestial figure. Paul's writings do represent the best evidence for a historical Jesus, which is kind of sad. I say that because in several places, Paul definitely distinguishes his information as only coming from visions of Jesus and his understanding of the scriptures. The scriptures in this instance would be the Septuagint or the Old Testament. Galatians 1, 11 through 12 and Romans 16, 25 through 26 shows that Paul throughout his time as an apostle established his knowledge of Jesus, not through any historical source, but through visions and scriptures. 
This is drastically different from what we find for other historical figures. Other historical figures like Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Julius Caesar, Spartacus, etc. have direct historical references instead of appeals to scriptures and hallucinations. Paul has to separate himself from any historical source if he's going to be accepted as an apostle. Apostles, according to Paul, were the men who had visions of Jesus after he resurrected. That was the only way that Paul could ever get uh, accurate information about Jesus and be trusted by people. If his information came from someone here on earth, he would not have been considered an apostle or trustworthy. Another thing that works against the idea that Paul considered Jesus as a historical figure is that he never mentions disciples. The Gospels later co-opted names mentioned by Paul to be disciples, but he can't use that knowledge uh, that appeared with the Gospels when examining Paul's writing. The disciples, for all we can know, were invented with the Gospels. In Galatians, when Paul talks about seeing the other apostles, he never designates them as disciples. He only designates them as apostles. When Paul lists off uh, various types of Christians in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 28 and 29 and 1 Corinthians 9, 5, he never indicates anyone is a disciple. The fact that our closest contemporary to Jesus that definitely had reason to talk about those that were disciples of a historical Jesus but doesn't is devastating to the claim that Paul knew of a historical Jesus. But none of that covers what Paul actually believed about Jesus. He could have actual knowledge um, uh, of, uh, uh, he, he could not have actual knowledge of a historical Jesus, but nevertheless, he believed that he was historical. This is not the case, though. Paul considered Jesus to be a pre-existent celestial being that was given a fleshly body that could die as an atonement sacrifice, as indicated by 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Romans 3, 23 through 26, uh, Romans 5, 6 through 11, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, and resurrects. Uh, also, all of this it being indicated by Philippians 2, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and Romans 8, 3. We know that Paul had the idea that Jesus was given a humanoid body because of Philippians 2, 6 through 8. He mentions that Jesus was given a body that was made for him. One might say that celestial beings or archangels, as Jesus was, couldn't die, but that's why he was given a fleshly humanoid body. Uh, a similar scenario already existed in Judaism before Paul. Philo also attests to the Jewish belief that Moses was a pre-existent divine figure uh, that became human only to rise back up to his appointed station in heaven. And that comes from Bart Ehrman in um, uh, his, his, uh, his book on how Jesus became God or, or the book titled that. Nothing in Paul indicates that any of this happened on earth, but there is a significant evidence uh, there is significant evidence that he probably believed it uh, uh, to have happened in the firmament or the lower heavens. 1 Corinthians 2 through 8 talks about the rulers of this age crucifying Jesus. Ultimately, this passage is too ambiguous to make a definite conclusion. Most Christians use this passage as an indication that Paul thought the Romans crucified Jesus, but that's not actually what it says. The Greek word used here is archon. Archon means ruler or chief, so I can understand why you might think that it references the Romans. But are the Romans the rulers of the age? Again, you might suppose so because that, uh, because of the mass uh, uh, of the vast Roman Empire, but obviously they didn't rule the entire known world at the time. So, who would the ruler of this age be? Well, that would be Satan. Paul identifies Satan as the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It was very common in Jewish and Christian beliefs that the ruler of this age was Satan. Another aspect of, about 1 Corinthians 2 through 8 is the part where it says that the rulers of this age would not have killed Jesus if they had known who he was. In Romans 13, Paul uh, says that the earthly authorities only do God's will. We know that it was God's will to have Jesus die so he could defeat Satan. So we have evidence. Uh, so do we have evidence that other Christians believe the same thing? Yes, we do. The Ascension of Isaiah is a first century uh, Christian document that represents a community of Christians that literally believe that Jesus descended from the upper heavens to the lower heavens. More specifically, the firmament to be killed by demons that inhabit that part of the celestial realm. Uh, 
By doing this, Jesus defeats Satan and his demons and then rises back up to the upper heavens with God. This is the earliest version of the ascension. Uh, other later versions have added material that places Jesus on earth instead of the firmament. This document has various aspects that connects with Paul's theology. The idea of multiple layers of heaven is expressed by Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. The idea that Jesus shed his celestial status and powers to become human in another is another common point. In this document, rulers of this world is used to denote de demonic rulers, not human ones. We also have later synoptic gospels also using archon, the same Greek uh, root word, to talk about Satan. That would be Mark 3.22, Matthew 12.24, Luke 11.15. Uh, some take issue with the idea that crucifixions were happening in the firmament, but this is actually canon to Christianity. Hebrews 9, 22 to 24 indicates that the things that exist on earth are just imperfect copies of things in heaven, in which the firmament would be part of the celestial realm. The ascension of Isaiah shows that, uh, shows that early Christians considered the lower heavens to have uh, truer versions of things or that the lower uh, heavens have the truer versions of all of the things on earth. So what I've demonstrated here is that Paul doesn't have any of his information from historical sources. The only places that he got his information from were visions and the scriptures. So that totally segregates himself from any historical source. And then I covered how Paul's theology about uh, Jesus as a celestial being, being that he's preexistent and that he had a body made for him, using the Greek word that specifically is used for manufacture and, and making things, um, that, that proves that Paul had a theology of Jesus being a, a pre-existent figure, having a body made possibly out of Davidic flesh, as uh, Paul later claims and as Hayden pointed out. And uh, then he was crucified and died by Satan in the firmament, because in the firmament there are copies of everything that also exists on earth, which is canon to Christianity, then after that, he rose back up to heaven, and this is how he defeated the rulers of this age, or Satan and his demons. That would be another reason why Satan wouldn't want to crucify him if he knew who Jesus was when he was crucifying him. So um, I know that there's a lot of people out there that think that this is like crack pot sort of uh, reasoning uh, that goes into this. But all everything that I've cited before has come from multiple different scholarly sources. So this is not emphatically not only debated online. Currently, there are two uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, books out there that ascertain the question of whether or not Jesus existed. That would be Dr. Richard Carrier on the historicity of Jesus, and then Raphael Letaster. He's also got a book in the scholarly realm, and nobody has written a book or an article refuting either book. So it would it would behoove everybody to not say that this is a, just an online uh, uh, fringe sort of, of thing that's being debated. It's definitely being debated in the scholarship, and there are multiple scholars out there that are not convinced that Jesus was historical. And the uh, uh, Paul's writings are vague enough to where we can't determine whether or not he believed Jesus actually existed in history, but I think that there's enough evidence here to move the needle in support of him thinking that Jesus was purely a celestial figure that was crucified in the lower part of the heavens, uh, the firmament. So uh, with that, I think that uh, I'll be done. Uh, I don't think that was a full 15 minutes, but, you know, uh, we'll get to the rebuttals, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you can always add time to your rebuttal if you need. So thank you for that, John. Uh, I think I saw a few questions come in. Keep adding questions. We'll get to them at the end, but we'll go to a 10-minute rebuttal. Uh, Hayden, you can start whenever you're ready. So first, I just wanted to say that we weren't actually asking the question whether or not Jesus existed. Uh, the question is whether or not Paul believed that Jesus existed. And so there was a lot going on there that had to do with whether or not Jesus existed, which just simply wasn't the question being asked. 
Uh, a couple of other points before I dive into some specifics, just kind of some more general points that I wanted to make was uh, Paul's theology is celestial or heavenly about Jesus. Yes, of course it is. Uh, I said that in my opening statement. Um, as all Christians believe this. And so making the point that Paul believed in a celestial Jesus uh, doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, what you have to show is that Paul only believed in celestial Jesus. And so pointing to passages and places where Paul says that he believes in a celestial or heavenly Jesus just doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, the, the last thing you said about being ignored or not being debated, you, you said at one point that it was not debated or that no scholars had refuted Carrier and others. And then you went on to say that it is debated among scholars. I found those two things to be contradictory. Uh, you just said that no one has refuted it, and then so clearly it's not being debated. It's it's largely being ignored, um, which is why I, a non-scholar, am happy to take it up because I don't think scholars are very much interested in the question at all. And anyway, I got some particular things I want to get to, but I just wanted to point out that most of what his uh, John's opening statement had to say had almost nothing to do with Paul. He's talking about uh, different Gospels. I was just talking about the Gospels for a little while. He's talking about the Ascension of Isaiah and Philo. Philo, the Ascension of Isaiah. I'm going to get specifically into the Ascension of Isaiah, but there are there is no indication whatsoever from the Apostle Paul's le uh, actual letters that indicate that he used either Philo or the Ascension of Isaiah as a source. And so I don't see what the relevance is with respect to whether or not Paul believed in a historical Jesus, which I remind. Uh, the audience that that is the question before us, not whether the historical Jesus existed, but what Paul believed about the historical Jesus, or specifically did Paul believe in a historical Jesus? And the ascension of Isaiah and uh, Philo just have absolutely no bearing on that question whatsoever, although they had plenty interesting things to say, and they might have relevance for the historical uh, Jesus. It has absolutely no bearing on whether or not Paul believed in historical Jesus, because uh, there's just absolutely zero evidence that Paul used either of them as literary sources. But I do want to talk about the ascension of Isaiah anyway, so I'm glad it got brought up. And I'm going to be largely uh, drawing on Richard Carrier's work on the ascension of Isaiah. I think that's probably where J John is, is getting his uh, information on the ascension of Isaiah. Even if he's not, it'll at least be helpful to use as an outline in my critique of this uh, attempted reading of it. That is the attempt to read it as a purely uh, celestial Jesus uh, from the ascension of Isaiah, and that that somehow carried over into uh, first century Christ uh, Christianity, and, and specifically here tonight into Paul's thinking. So remember, again, specifically we're talking about Paul's letters. And so in Carrier's work on this, he, uh, he agrees that Paul's letters were dated in the 50s. Carrier says, I think that assessment is probably correct. That's a quote from page 305 of his book. Uh, that's the Kindle version. Carrier dates the earliest gospel to no earlier than 70 CE, and as he does that just a couple pages later. Uh, Carrier then says, with respect to the ascension of Isaiah, the, quote, the earliest version, in fact, was probably composed around the very same time as the earliest canonical gospels were being written. Uh, he says that on page 53, again on the Kindle version. And then Carrier says on page 64 that Paul's, quote, Lord of glory in 1 Corinthians 2.8 quote, looks like a direct paraphrase of an early version of the Ascension of Isaiah. So Carrier wants to, first of all, Carrier wants to stretch the date of the Ascension of Isaiah far earlier than anyone else, which is just a, um, a commonplace thing to do if you're going to be a mythicist. First of all, the, the entire thing is an outlier belief, and now you have to take the a dating of a, of a text way earlier than anybody else does. And so it's just one thing falls after the other. So Carrier wants to stretch the dating of the ascension of Isaiah far earlier than anyone else. It's usually dated in the second century. Uh, but even if we grant his stretch, it isn't, earlier en it isn't earlier enough to be quoted by Paul, even by Carrier's own datings. According to Carrier, uh, his datings, Paul's written two decades earlier than the earliest gospel, which is when he says the Ascension of Isaiah was written, which means that Paul's letters were being written almost two decades before the Ascension of Isaiah. And according to the majority of scholars, it was written uh, many decades later. Uh, most scholars, again, date it to the second century, if at best, the late first century. Uh, second, Carrier's assessment that the beloved, which is how this uh, figure is re uh, referenced in the Ascension, uh, it's not referenced as Jesus. It's, it's referenced as the beloved in the ascension did not descend 
to the earth is uh, anything but obvious. Carrier wants to say they did not come to the earth. I think that's uh, less than obvious. In fact, it seems that the beloved did come to the earth based on the ascension's use of the term Sheol, uh, which is under the earth. So in order to reach Sheol from the heavens, you would have to go through the earth. Third, even if Carrier is correct and the ascension portrays the beloved as only descending to the firmament, in chapter 7, verse 10 in the ascension, uh, we read this. It says, and as above, so on the earth, for the likeness of what is in the firmament is here on earth. And not just the figures, but the events taking place. And this was a common docetic belief. In other words, what happens in the firmament is a mirror image of what happens on earth. So if Carrier thinks that Jesus was crucified in the firmament, fine. Uh, he was also crucified on the earth, according to the ascension. And Carrier even, uh, he even hints at this in a footnote that he, in his book, uh, where he says, although to be more precise, it is the things on earth that are the copies of the truer versions in the heavens. And so he understands this perfectly fine. So it's anything but obvious that the ascension portrays celestial Jesus only. And again, emphasis on the word only. All right, it can't be emphasized enough that it, the mythicist must prove that the, whether the ascension or Paul only believed in celestial Jesus. And furthermore, uh, it's, it's most improbable, if not logically impossible, that Paul is quoting the Ascension. Uh, if anything, the relationship would go in the opposite direction since the Ascension was written much later. So I don't think that the Ascension is going to get us anywhere. Um, you pointed out that Paul only got his information from the visions in the scriptures. I don't see how it has any relevance to the question of whether or not Paul believed in a historical Jesus, where he got his information from. Uh, isn't particularly uh, relevant to the question. Uh, he may very well have only gotten his information from a vision that he had of Jesus, but that information, what the information is, is what's in debate. Was that information that Jesus was a historical figure, or was that information that Jesus was only a celestial figure? And so I don't see where he got it from has any relevance, not to mention uh, that it is false that that's the only place that he got information from. Paul does pick up traditions from the Jerusalem apostles. He explicitly tells us, like I said in my opening statement, that he spent a couple of weeks in Jerusalem with Cephas and the other apostles, specifically James. And uh, so unless we think that they were just talking about the weather and that Jesus and the traditions surrounding Jesus were never brought up, uh, I think it would just be foolish to assume that he didn't get any of his uh, traditions there, especially like in 1 Corinthians 15, where we see him clearly citing a tradition that he says he received. And you can say he received it from uh, Jesus, straight uh, from a vision of Jesus. But it seems obvious to me that he at least got some of his information from the Jerusalem apostles. And so that, that claim would be false, not that it really has any relevance in the first place. He doesn't mention any disciples. Again, I don't know what relevance that has. Uh, we're not debating whether or not the historical Jesus existed and had d disciples. Uh, the question is, what did Paul believe, um, and you said that Paul believed Jesus to be the pre-existent celestial being. Of, of course he did. Um, I've said that in my opening statement. All Christians believe that, uh, but the question is, is that all that Paul believed? Uh, Philo believed Moses to be some kind of celestial figure. Whether he did or not is irrelevant, but he clearly, obviously, like every Jew, believed that Moses was also an earthly figure. Uh, and I showed why 1 Corinthians means that uh, the 1 Corinthians passage about the rulers of the age uh, means Roman authorities by referencing uh, Romans 13.3, where the same phrase uh, clearly means governmental authorities when and used in conjunction with the death penalty, which is exactly what crucifixion is. Um, and then a, a more larger point to make is just that in Second Temple Judaism, there was not this dichotomy between the spiritual powers and the governmental uh, authorities as if they were two separate things they viewed them really as a one and the same so the rulers of this age obviously can be used to refer to celestial figures or angelic beings or demonic forces we might say but it, it also is a reference to governmental authorities and i showed why in my opening statement i think the corinthian passage and the romans passage are instances of governmental authorities there may have been demonic forces at work behind them we might say but it, it also included governmental authorities uh, I think that'll do, and it's just about 10 minutes. Awesome, Hayden. Um, we'll transition this now to John. Uh, whenever you're ready, you have 10 minutes. Or you can have more, obviously. Your opening statement is kind of short. But whenever you're ready, just go. 
Okay. Um, I appreciate your response there, Hayden. Although I don't really understand why you think my entire thing was just on the historicity of Jesus when I specifically only referenced when I was supporting the idea that Paul didn't believe in historical Jesus. I only referenced Paul's writings all throughout my opening statement. So I don't understand why you think that I just didn't handle the question at all. I was providing other sources outside of Paul to show that other Christians were thinking the same things at this time. So it's not really out of the realm of, of, of possibility that Paul would also be thinking this. I mean, th this this would be like 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 a standard thing to do whenever you're trying to figure out what in, uh, what Paul is trying to talk about here. Um, you talked about uh, the descendant of David, and uh, you know how it in in various things like uh, Romans uh, one three, how it talks about him being a descendant of David. But I would love for you to tell me what Greek word they use. Maybe maybe we can bring that up. I don't know. Do we have a discussion uh, for this, like a discussion period? Uh, we don't have it in, but I mean, if you guys both agree, we could just throw something in if you guys want. Um, so, I guess, I, I, I guess uh, I'll, uh, I'll, no, I won't. Agree, I won't agree to that. And you can have more time for me interrupting, but I won't agree to that. And you can happily tell us what the Greek word is, or I can look it up on my Logos software here if you want. Oh, okay. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So uh, the actual Greek word that uh, Paul uses here, which is very important for you to actually look at the Greek word is genomai. Uh, genomai is generally used uh, when you're talking about made or manufactured. Uh, in my opening statement, I agreed that Paul uh, believes that Jesus had a fleshly body, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, Jesus came to earth in a fleshly body. Um, the fleshly body could have been made in, uh, you know, Davidic flesh. Uh, this would explain why later on in the Gospels you have this contrived way of going about solidifying the lineage of Jesus. Uh, because uh, there's various different communities out there that uh, needed a Davidic link uh, to a historical Jesus. And for some reason, Jesus is divinely born of, you know, the union between God and Mary. But at the same time, you trace his lineage back through jo uh, uh, Joseph. Um, I don't exactly understand that. Uh, maybe you can explain it. But in this particular passage in Paul, he uses a, the Greek word for make. Uh, or, or manufacture, and that would be genomai. Whenever he talks about Jesus being born in this sense, he, he only ever uses genomai, and he uses different words when he's talking about uh, being born like uh, physically here on earth and other passages. So if I'm wrong about that, I would love for you to bring it up where he uses genomai to denote somebody else being born uh, on, on this earth at that point. Um, and then you mentioned the brother James. Uh, again, um, I, I have to reiterate that you've got to go back to the Greek word that is actually used there. And the Greek word that Paul uses in order to denote a brother of the Lord does not concretely point us in the direction of a blood brother. Can that particular word uh, mean a, a, a blood brother? Yes, it can. Uh, but it also can mean a fictive kinship. I believe you brought that up in, in your uh, initial uh, opening to me. But uh, the James that's mentioned in Galatians 1.19 is just a general Christian. And I know that you seem to have a problem with that because you feel like all apostles and Christians would be denoted as brothers of the Lord. But in that particular section, he goes through... Uh, uh, he, he goes the extra link to make uh, the length to make sure that you understand that one is an apostle and the other is just a general Christian. You would not call a, a you know the the apostle a brother of the Lord if you're trying to distinguish him from the other person that's just a general Christian. That's all he was trying to do, and the words there seem to support that particular position. But ultimately, this is a very vague statement that doesn't actually support the conclusion that he was talking about a blood brother because of how he uses it in other areas of his writings. Like you mentioned, the sisters. We don't think that he was talking about literal blood sisters or by 
excuse me, biological sisters when he was talking about being able to take a sister along. Funny enough, he uses the exact same word to, to uh, specify sister in that situation as he does uh, with the brother of the Lord here. Also, brother of the Lord is a title, and it's not like brother of Jesus. If he wanted to be more explicit about it without using something like according to the flesh or something like that, you could definitely say that he would have said brother of Jesus Christ or, or something of that nature. Um, now, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 2 through 8, um, you say that I'm just inter it's just an interpretation uh, uh, or it's an argument from silence. Um, uh, about the archons of this aeon, I'm guessing, because that's what the, the two through eight is. Uh, my entire point in bringing up like uh, the ascension of Isaiah and stuff like that is to show how it was very common usage in the first century for you to use archon in order to denote the rulers of this age or the rulers of this world, which Paul considered to be Satan. You see, I also talked about how Paul later on in his writings De, uh, 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 described the ruler of this world as Satan using the exact same verbiage as he does right here in this particular passage. So I still don't know why you're saying that, uh, you know, I just didn't ever address the question in this particular debate because I obviously did. I just used other materials to support my conclusion that he was most likely talking about certain definitions or certain understandings that he had. Like, for instance, um, with the ascension of Isaiah, uh, you know, you talk about how, uh, in, in I guess uh, one particular later redaction that exists in the second century, it has Jesus, you know, coming to Earth or going to Sheol or whatever. Um, the earliest redaction that we actually have of the ascension of Isaiah does not contain those parts. So I'd love to hear your uh, discussion or, or or your explanation on why that particular version of the Ascension of Isaiah exists. Um, you also said that all in the Ascension of Isaiah, it says that all events happen in the firmament and on earth. So that means that Jesus was crucified uh, on the earth. But I, I don't think that it actually says that. It actually says that just all things like physical things that exist on the earth also exist in the heavens as uh, the, the ones on the earth are imperfect copies that, uh, compared to the ones that are in uh, the lower firmament. Uh, Philo, you also mentioned, is uh, obviously relevant to this because Philo would have been a contemporary to uh, 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 Paul. And, you know, Philo was a Jew. And since Paul started out as a Jew who had advanced his understanding of Judaism beyond his peers, would have also had similar ideas to Philo, especially considering the fact that Philo describes his logos the same way that Paul ends up describing Jesus. So it's very obvious that there is a Philo-Paul connection here and the fact that Philo doesn't have a problem with Moses being a preexistent figure, being given a body that's uh, a, f a fleshly body that then it I admittedly, it does strut around here on earth, but it also dies and goes back into heaven. This was an example of how pre-existent archangel figures or celestial beings rather can inhabit these fleshly bodies and be sent somewhere to die and then raise back up into heaven. That was the point of bringing that up. Um, so I, I, you also mentioned Romans 13, 3. Uh, as a way that uh, the rulers are meaning Romans, and I would agree in that particular uh, that particular passage right there, it probably does mean the Romans, but it also doesn't say rulers of this age. That's a very specific uh, thing. When 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 Paul is qualifying his rulers, his use of archon with of this age, we have to look at who Paul would have considered to be the ruler of this world or of this age, which I would assume that you as a Christian would agree that Satan is the ruler of this world, especially considering that's what Paul says. Um, so uh, every single facet of my opening statement was definitely connected to the question of whether or not Paul considered to be 
uh, consider Jesus to be a historical figure. And I feel like I fairly well cemented the fact that Paul is at least vague enough to where we don't know, but also has a lot of evidence to support the idea that he possibly didn't think that he was a historical figure and only considered him to be celestial because of all of the references that I have within Paul's uh, uh, verified or, well, as verified as we can get his, his original text. So um, let's see, I think that's, that's all the notes that I have. Um, again, um, you know, th this is debated in the scholarly area. I mean, to say that it's not is really just, uh, you know, ignoring all of the conversation that's being had between scholars over it. Uh, so, I mean, for you to just totally dismiss um, all of the scholars that are not convinced of Jesus's existence in history, not only that, but the two peer-reviewed works that have been published about it, um, it, it just because there's not any, uh, you know, rebuttals to it does not exactly mean that it's not being debated in the scholarly community. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about how varying evidence, uh, bits of evidence uh, are being debated in the scholarly community that directly concerns this particular uh, thing. I mean, Bart Ehrman wrote a non-peer-reviewed book against Carrier, which was quite embarrassing, and it has been noted as being drastically different than all of his other works surrounding the historicity of Christianity in general. Uh, like I said before, you yourself pulled from Bart Ehrman, and you you think uh, you thanked Bart Ehrman prior to this, but yet Bart Ehrman agrees that Philo had this pre pre existent uh, pre existent Moses idea that shows that Paul could have also thought this, and that it was not out uh, out of nowhere that Paul would have come up with this. He would have um, he would have uh, taken it from existing Jewish theology just like he did with Jesus. He had the existing Jewish theology that Jesus was a pre-existent celestial figure, which I know that you agree with and everything. I'm not trying I I I, I was kind of um, uh, I'm glad that you admit that he's a pre-existent celestial figure, but my point was was that all of the um References that I have in here to Paul's letters, they do not concretely show us that Jesus, uh, that Paul thought that Jesus existed here on earth because of how vague he is. And I think that um, I'll, I'll cede whatever time I have left. Awesome. Thank you, John. Uh, we're going to go to closing statements here. Saw a bunch of questions coming in. We're going to get to those questions after these closing statements. Saw a bunch of questions for John, a few for Hayden. So feel free to put some more in and we'll get to those. Uh, in a few minutes, but uh, Hayden, we'll give the time to you. You have five minutes for your closing remarks. Okay, I might uh, have to be a, a little sporadic here. Uh, when, when I say that no one debates this in scholarship, I clearly don't mean like zero people. Obviously, I referenced Ehrman myself. Um, I'm trying to figure out what, what order I want to take this in. So the Moses thing, again, has no relevance for one thing. Uh, because Paul's not using Philo as a, a literary source. He's not literarily dependent on Philo nor the Ascension. And so pointing out that they had certain beliefs, therefore perhaps Paul had certain beliefs, um, I don't see how that has much relevance. But if you get to do that, then I could do the same thing with, say, the Gospels, which clearly believe that Jesus was a historical figure. And I could say, well, these Christians believe that Jesus was a historical figure. Therefore, Paul probably understood it in the exact same sense. Now, I'm sure you would... Uh, call foul on that. And that's all I'm saying is that there's no sense in using later sources in the case of the Ascension to uh, conclude that Paul believed in a celestial Jesus. For one thing, the, the, the only possible dependence that could exist there is that the Ascension would be dependent on Paul because it is a later writing. And I showed why it was a, a later writing, even according to Richard Carrier, who says it was written the earliest uh, redaction was written at the same time that the Gospels were being written, which he says he agrees with the consensus, which is around 70 CE, which would be a, a, at least a decade or two after Paul. Uh, the mythicists on Ehrman, I mean, you made the, the statement yourself, which you said it had, is notably worse than his, his other writings. Uh, I think it's just hilarious because it's like, you know, you're all happy 
to say that uh, Bart Ehrman is a wonderful scholar when it comes to his criticisms of the resurrection, uh, but as soon as he writes a book on the historicity of Jesus, suddenly he's a very bad scholar. Um, I just think that's hilarious. You kept making the point that I didn't read the Greek word. I didn't read the Greek word because you're not a Greek scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar, and the majority of our audience is not a Greek scholar, and there's absolutely no point in pointing it out. I showed exactly how Paul uses the word descendant by going through Romans and Galatians and using the English translation of it. I, I guess I could have used the Greek word, but I thought I was being fair enough whenever I, I pointed out the very different ways that he uses that Greek word without actually saying the Greek word itself. And I did want to point out that in the Septuagint, this Greek word is used 75% of the time to denote a biological human descendant. So there's some context outside of Paul if we're going to you know, start pulling from there. And I explained why, in this case, the, the, the fact that it can mean manufacturer or something like that, um, it, it doesn't matter whenever you take into consideration the way it's being used in that specific context. I went through that specific context and showed how when Paul uses the term descendant and the, the word he uses there for born in context – or in conjunction with according to the flesh, it means human biological ancestry every single time in Paul. Again, we don't have to go outside the Pauline corpus because Paul himself provides a plethora of examples and shows us exactly what he means by this word when it is used in conjunction with according to the flesh. Uh, the rulers of this age, I agree that the ruler of the age would be the Satan and that the, the rulers of this age can denote um, something like demonic influences. But again, in Second Temple Judaism, there was not this hard and fast distinction between the demonic forces and the governmental authorities. I showed why in Paul does use uh, this phrase to reference governmental authorities, not rulers of the state specifically, but rulers to denote uh, governmental authorities in Romans 13 and how he uses that in conjunction with um, capital punishment. And so when he does it over in the Corinthian passage, there's no reason to interpret that any differently. And so I think that the burden of showing that Paul only believed in celestial Jesus has not been met. And, um, that John still has all of his work ahead of him, that he would need to show that not that just that Paul believed in a pre-existent celestial Jesus, every Christian that's ever existed believed in that. Um, he would have to show that Paul only believed in that. And then lastly, with my remaining 30 seconds, I just wanted to say to the audience that not only, and, and John as well, of course, uh, not only do I uh, agree with Paul that Jesus uh, was a historical person, but I also agree with Paul that Jesus is Lord, and that if you repent and trust in him, you will be saved from sin and death. And so I agree with both of Paul's statements that Paul is the celestial uh, being, the preexistent son of God and the savior of this world, and that also Jesus was a fleshly, walk the earth kind of historical person. Awesome. Thank you, Hayden. Uh, we'll go to John here. You got five minutes for your closing statement before we dive into some Q&A. So whenever you're ready, let it go. Okay. Um, so I, I liked how you kind of contradicted yourself immediately right out the gate in your rebuttal, uh, because you said, uh, when, when you said no people uh, de debate this topic in, in, in scholarship or anything like that, you didn't mean literally no one. So I'm just kind of curious as to what you mean by nobody. I mean, it just, it, it's a little confusing when you say nobody, but you don't really mean nobody. So uh, that, that was, the, I thought that was a little ironic. Um, uh, Paul, I, I do agree that Paul could have thought uh, Jesus to be a historical figure. My entire point in this was to prove that Jesus, that that Paul's uh, 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 Paul's content of his scriptures, um, uh, his epistles, uh, they're actually vague, uh, too vague to make a concrete. Uh, uh, argument for either case. Uh, that has always been, I said that right up front in my opening statement. So uh, what I was presenting was passages and things that I thought pushed the needle just slightly to the side of Jesus not, or, or, or Paul not considering Jesus to be a historical figure. Um, you, you say that I still have all my work ahead of me, but I really don't understand why you would think that considering that Everything that I've done in here is to support the idea that 
Paul didn't consider Jesus to be a historical person. Um, you, 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 you kind of had a little bit of a cocky moment there when you were talking about how, oh, we can bring in all these other different sources. And uh, because I, I use the Ascension of Isaiah, um, uh, first of all, I didn't use the Ascension of Isaiah to prove that Paul uh, exactly thought something. What I did is a more nuanced position of showing you that Paul just didn't pull it out of his butt. And that he wasn't just making stuff up because that's a lot less likely than Paul uh, just mimicking what other Christians were already thinking at the time. It's the exact same thing that I was doing with Philo, showing that Paul didn't just come up with this stuff on his own, that there were other other Jews and other Jewish Christians at the time that were thinking the exact same things. So what that does is it establishes the idea that uh, could that could be exemplified by Paul already existing in the community at the time. Because while the Ascension of Isaiah wasn't written until the 70s, it, it was definitely a sect of Christians that existed prior to the 70s. Because oral history would have been circulated at first, and then it would have been written down. But even even if we just have you know the earliest redaction being in the seventies, um, which isn't a stretch, by the way. Uh, Richard Carrier does have great work on the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, I highly uh, uh, you know implore people to read uh, Carrier's position on. Uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, why he thinks it dates so early. But th the fact of the matter is, is that I wasn't using those particular sources in order to say that Paul was citing those or should cite those. I was establishing that Jews and Jewish Christians were thinking the exact same things at the time. So Paul is just another example of a sect of Christians that was thinking the same things at that time. Uh, I know earlier you also uh, talked about how James, uh, you know, the brother of the Lord and how um, um, uh, Paul went to uh, Jerusalem and talked with Cephas and, uh, and other people there, other Christians there. So they, he must have gotten uh, his information like from them. But I also like how that's kind of a low key saying that's just you low key saying that Paul's a liar. And I'm really not on. Uh, I'm, I'm not with the whole argument of calling Paul a liar, because then you have to question everything else that you have that Paul gives you, which is pretty much the only evidence for a historical Jesus that you have. So uh, I wouldn't suggest you calling Paul a liar in that instance when he says that he only got his information from visions and scriptures, and and then and then coming back in and be like, yeah, but he you know he really got it from historical sources. I mean it, that's just. That, that 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 would literally be an argument from silence that is not valid because we don't have Paul anywhere saying that he got his information from any kind of historical source or that he discussed any information with Kephas or James the Pillar, uh, who later on in Galatians, uh, 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 Paul comes back to confer with them about his gospel and found that there was no difference in the gospel that he was teaching compared to theirs. So Paul had the same gospel as the other apostles that were the major players in the first century. So if Paul was thinking that Jesus wasn't historical and that uh, it was a purely celestial existence, a purely celestial crucifixion, then all of the other uh, 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 apostles and, and sects of Christians that would eventually become mainstream also thought that thing. So... Um, you said that there's no point in pointing out the Greek words. It's very important to point out what Greek words were used because Greek uh, has, uh, you know, many, many different meanings for a word. And it really depends on how it's used in order to indicate, you know, what the person actually means. So for like the genomai, uh, that's the Greek word for born uh, that you used. Um, it, it literally meaning manufacture rather than a human birth is very telling. Um, 
So I, I know I'm past my five minutes now, so I, I guess I'll just uh, say thank you guys for having me on here. Um, I really enjoy it. I really, I really do enjoy having this debate. And uh, I, I consider uh, Hayden to be a, a, a great interlocutor, and I'm, I would happily you know, talk to him again in the future. I, I hold no ill will against him or anything like that. I think you're a great person there, Hayden. We just disagree on this one point. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, it's been a fun date debate. It's been very lively. I uh, appreciate both your guys' passion and enthusiasm for this topic. Uh, so we'll go into some Q&A here. We have a good chunk of questions for John and also some questions for Hayden. Um, so we'll go for about 30 minutes, and we'll just see how much we can get through. Um, so the first question is for Hayden. I'll switch the screen here. This may help. Um, it says, given the Catholic position of Mary's perpetual virginity, what does James, the brother of Jesus, mean? If he's only a spiritual brother, does this support mythicism? Mary's brother. Well, I'm not a Catholic, so I, I don't know about the perpetual virginity. Um, I'm guessing that's supposed to mean that uh, not only was she a virgin, but she remained a virgin. And so uh, I don't know what the relevance even has to do with the James, the brother of Jesus quotation. So I, I'm a bit confused on the question to begin with. Uh, if he's only a spiritual brother, does this support mythicism? Uh, if he was only a spiritual brother, I don't think that would support mythicism, but it would do away with the argument that Paul believed that Jesus had a biological brother named James. Um, then we just wouldn't have that argument anymore. There'd still be the other ones that I mentioned. Um, but uh, I don't think that conditional statement, if he's only a spiritual brother, is true. So, uh, yeah, so I'm a bit confused on the question and the, everything else I said. So, wait, you're confused on what role um, procreation has in having siblings? No, I'm con confused about the Catholic position of Mary's perpetual virginity because I'm not a Catholic. Okay, well, I mean, if she was a perpetual virgin, which was the reigning idea, like until, uh, I guess, the uh, Protestant Reformation, I mean, it kind of seems like the, the original idea was that she was a perpetual virgin. So I, I know most Catholics out there actually rationalize it as being not a literal blood brother, but more or less like a blood cousin. And I would agree with Hayden here that it would not support mythicism because, uh, as I said in the debate, uh, this particular passage is is vague and doesn't support the posi position on either side. That uh, it being a brother of the Lord, being a spiritual or fictive kinship kind of brotherhood, um, uh, would not support mythicism. Um, like Hayden said, it would just kind of do away with the idea that Jesus had a blood brother. All right. Uh, next question is from Stephen Seen. Uh, it's a question for John. It says, First Corinthians is unquestioned as Paulian. Uh, First Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 explicitly states a literal birth, death, burial, and resurrection of a bodily Jesus. Why fight that? Um, you know, I, I, I don't have that memorized. So if you, if you will just um, bear with me for a second while I, I pull up the actual uh, words that that 15, uh, three through eight actually say, it says, uh, for what I received, I passed on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at that time, who, uh, most of whom were still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, the one abnormally born. The only one that um, is really talking about uh, birth is, is um, Paul talking about himself being abnormally born, which isn't a literal birth again. So this part really doesn't talk about a literal birth for Jesus Christ. Um, in fact, it doesn't even say Jesus in here. It just says Christ, which we all know now as Jesus. But Christ being a title, it's not exactly definite for it being Jesus. Um, also, another thing that you really need to note when you're looking at this particular thing is that it says, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, this is most definitely a very early creed. And I, I would agree. I pretty sure Hayden would agree with me saying that it, it definitely dates into the early thirties. Uh, but just because it dates early does not necessarily mean that, you know, that's when the belief started or that the event actually took place. 
Um, so n none of this is actually supportive of what you're talking about here. Uh, next question is for John as well. Um, it says, you mentioned Paul seemed to think that Jesus was of the flesh of David. David, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? If Jesus has the flesh of David, wouldn't he have had to come in the flesh? Sorry, I had it muted. Um, uh, wouldn't he have had to come in the flesh? Well, I mean, I agree that uh, he definitely did come in the flesh. Uh, I mean, I, my, my only disagreement with Hayden here is that he uh, actually descended to the earth and actually had an earthly existence rather than just existing in the firmament. That that's, I mean, it's 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 kind of a small area where I, I think both uh, Hayden and I disagree, but um, I, I would agree that. Uh, Jesus had Davidic flesh, as as Paul has said, uh, but I also think that it was made due to the words that Paul used. So, I mean, you you kind of have to contend with the actual words that Paul used, um, and, and not just sort of brush it off with modern, uh, you know, uh, definitions and understandings of words that we translate from the Greek. Uh, another question here for John. Um, it says, why did, why did no early enemies of Christianity per, uh, propose Jesus' mythicism? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because 2 Peter is an entire book in the Bible that was forged in order to give a historical account of Jesus where they specifically talk about how they did not, uh, you know, uh, believe in, uh, you know, myths. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there, there were early people that we would consider to be mythicists, uh, if you will. Um, there were several sects at the time that were going around. There was not such a narrow idea about Christianity in the first century. So there definitely were people that we might classify as mythicists today, although they probably didn't consider you know themselves mythicists because the term didn't exist back then. But there were definitely people that felt compelled to forge an entire book that eventually became canon that included a historical uh, reference to Jesus because people were saying, hey, He's just a mythical or celestial figure. And I think it would more likely be that Jesus was purely celestial and not just, you know, uh, and, and not historical. Yeah, Second Peter was definitely not written for that purpose. And there was nobody in the first century who claimed that Jesus was not a historical figure. That's a disargument from silence. Well, no, no, it, it, well, it's not, it's not an argument. I mean, unless you're saying that you, you're using an argument from silence. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying, that, well, we've already had the debate. I was just answering the question. Okay, let's just uh, keep moving on here. Um, maybe another debate. A uh, question for me, will you be sad when TikTok is banned? No, I will not be. Um, but for now, I'll keep making TikToks. Um, question for John Buck. It says, uh, question for Hayden, does Paul's writing support Gnosticism? Uh, no. No, that's almost specifically what I've been kind of arguing against okay um next question is for john uh it says from jonathan dupet 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 i don't know probably the pew. pew um he says what other greek word would have would have paul used to say jesus was born of a flesh and blood human um uh, I can't think of of the word right now in Greek um, that is indicative is more indicative or that more specifically that Paul uses to indicate a human or or uh, earthly birth, uh, but th they are vastly different. If you if you th there are several places on the internet where you can do interlinear, uh, uh, you know, have an interlinear look at. Uh, the the Greek words surrounding those. So if you have a particular uh, verse that you want to actually explore further, as far as uh, you know the Greek goes and what what words were actually being used, um, then uh, I suggest you just go and look that up. It's very important to know how a word is being used by a particular author because of the varying uses of the words in Greek and, and, and how just adding on a little bit of context changes the entire meaning of it. So 
um, that that's why it's important for you to to do that kind of investigation. Um, I, I I wish I had that word for you. I, I should have looked it up before this debate, but um, it, it's not really pertinent to my particular argument for the you know genomai meaning manufacture or make. So, um, but you could definitely take any verse that you find in in um, in uh, Paul where it talks about being born. And, uh, you know, you could determine what kind of birth he meant, either manufacture or a physical real birth. Uh, another question here from Jonathan Depew. Uh, he says for, um, I'm assuming this is going to be for John. It says, if Jesus wasn't crucified on earth, what is the significance of Philippians 2, 7? Jesus died as a Dulu slave. Do we have slave language used for celestial, celestial execution? Uh, you're on mute, John. I believe. Uh, sorry, I was just saying. Let let me look up that verse specifically so that I can see what he's talking about. So it says, "Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness." Um, again, uh, I, I guess I don't understand. No, I'm I'm fine now. They told me. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Um, so I, I guess I don't understand why you think that it would have been, uh, do we have slave language for uh, celestial? I think that's just like the version that you're using, um, like the interpretation of it, because I'm using NIV and it says servant, but I mean, servant, slave, uh, this is actually a uh, colorful language in order to describe, um, you know, human is uh, being made in human likeness. So basically it, this right here is literally saying that Jesus was manufactured to look like a human. And given the nature of Paul's writings, he's talking about being made uh, in Davidic flesh. Uh, specifically, that's where you get the whole, you know, the, <laughs> as Carrier likes to put it, the cosmic sperm bank. But it, when you get down to it, you know, removing all, all of that kind of inflammatory language, it was just that God made Jesus out of Davidic flesh directly you know, bypassing any need for any kind of lineage connecting him to uh, uh, Joseph, or not Joseph, but uh, um, connecting him to David, um, which would solve, you know, the Matthew and Luke uh, genealogy problem pretty well. Uh, another question here for John from uh, Stephen Seen. He says, why does Paul say Jesus was um, sent by God, born of, I'm assuming, of a woman and born under the law in Galatians 4.4? All right. Uh, again, let me pull that up. Uh, but when the set time uh, fully come, God sent his son born of a woman under the law. Uh, I believe that is also using genomai, which means manufacture. Let me uh, so sorry to put you all through this, but um, I can I can just pull this up really quick. Like I said, you, all you got to type is the Bible verse in Greek and you can come pull up an interlinear text. Uh, sent forth as a son of God, having been born, Genenamon. Yes, that means manufacture, manufactured. So I mean, he was he was he was manufactured. That's that's what Genenamon means. So uh, you you can you can look up the Strong's Greek Concordance for the word manufactured of a woman. Well, yeah, I mean, like again, he's he's using colorful language to indicate. Uh, you know, that he was born. It says, I come into being and born, become, come about, happen. I, I think that this uh, Galatians 4.4 4, uh, is more is, is more referencing being manufactured rather than, um, you know, being born of a mother, which I, I have my app right here, which I, I won't push on your show. But um, Paul says that the mothers he is speaking of are allegorical, not real in Galatians 4.24. Uh, which woman you were born to. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th this is the verse that's talking allegorically about being born of a woman. Uh, the woman here uh, the, is symbolic of like the earth or uh, the world uh, kind of thing. Um, uh, it says, and uh, confirming that he uses the same word here for of Jesus that he used for divine manufacture elsewhere. 
uh, just like with Adam and our future resurrection bodies, a word he never uses for human birth. Uh, in contrast, when in the same section he refers to human births, he, he uses his preferred word for that, which he suspiciously uh, did not use for Jesus. Uh, so it says compare it to uh, 423. 423. So, but the one indeed of the slave woman according to the flesh, having been born. Ah, here's here's the Greek word for the, the one that he actually uses. It's uh uh gigenite. I'm horrible at pronouncing stuff. Gigeno. Uh so it's different than genomai. Uh geno genoa something. That is, a, that is a lot more explicit. It, the usage is, I begat of the male, of the female, I bring forth, I give birth to. So it's, it's a lot more explicit is what the word is. All right. I uh, got a question for Hayden here. I can't find it in the live chat. So if you just need me to repeat it, Hayden, let me know. Um, it's a question from John V. He says, why does Paul never talk about Jesus's ministry, miracles, exorcisms, or disciples? Uh, he did. Am I unmuted? No, you're good. Okay. okay. So he does mention the 12. He does mention the apostles. You want to make some very strong point between the distinction between an apostle or the 12 and disciples uh, have at it, given that majority of scholars do take the gospels seriously. Uh, Paul's mention of Cephas and the 12 give us a very in good in the fact that he was familiar with Jerusalem apostles and that the Gospels end with the Twelve being in Jerusalem do lend the conclusion that Paul, in all probability, knew who the original disciples were. Of course, you know, if you read, if you don't think that the Gospels have any historical uh, reliability whatsoever, you're not going to conclude that way, but most people do think that there is a kernel of historical truth that runs through the Gospels. Uh, so I just think that that statement is false, not to mention Paul also is familiar with some of the early uh, traditions that reflect Jesus's teachings, which we also find in the Gospels, like the teaching of the, the Last Supper and things like that. So it's I think it's just false that Paul's not familiar with the disciples or with um, I mean, the, or with uh, any of his teachings, uh, exorcisms. Uh, yeah, none come off the top of my head again you have to remember that paul's letters are occasional meaning he's addressing specific he's writing back and forth with these churches it's a correspondence and he, so he's addressing their concerns and you know it makes a lot of sense that they wouldn't have the exact same concerns as say the gospel writers or things like that and so i mean the fact that paul does not write about something does not mean it didn't happen especially if we have other first century sources which do record it so i mean this is it's at best an argument from silence if the person is trying to go that route of course he just asked a question i don't know what direction this person is trying to go with it but uh yeah anyway uh Next question is from John Buckets, the Super Chat. Thank you, John. Uh, he says, what does it mean to have Davidic flesh? Is, is that for both? I I don't know. So I guess you can both just kind of answer it. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Well, I would say that it's just literally what it means to have Davidic flesh to be uh, made. Well, in, in, in the case of Jesus, specifically how Paul actually – talks about it being made in Davidic flesh. Uh, so it's manufactured a lot like how God manufactured a body for uh, Adam and how God will manufacture our resurrection bodies. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just literally, uh, you know, Davidic, it's got a direct lineage to David, which is handled both on my, uh, my thesis as well as uh, Hayden's. Well, I hope he does manufacture our resurrection bodies, John. I hope that that does happen um, and that you do become a Christian and be manufactured in the resurrection. Uh, I kind of not, I'm not joking, but yeah, just kind of playing on your words there. Uh, but actually in Genesis, we're referencing Adam, the manufacturing takes place. Not um, The word that is used whenever God breathes life into Adam and creates a human being is not... Uh, or I'm sorry, that's when the term manufacture is used in the Septuagint, which would have been Paul's Old Testament. Uh, it's not whenever God is forming man out of the dust. He does not use uh, the Greek word uh, that you keep bringing up, manufacture. He doesn't use it there. So it's actually uh, not true that that's the way that that word is used. 
Uh, and I think that uh, what does it mean to have Davidic flesh? It means what it uh, means everywhere else in Paul, whenever he uses the word uh, manufacturer or descendant, whenever he uses the word descendant in conjunction with according to the flesh, he means a biological human ancestry every other single time in his correspondence. And so I think it obviously means so in this case. Awesome, guys. Uh, that's all the questions we have. So appreciate you both. It's been a really great debate. I think everyone's enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. Um, both you guys have defended your positions well. Uh, encourage everyone to subscribe to Hayden Clark. Help me believe. Lots of awesome stuff going on there. And everyone should go subscribe to John Gleason, the godless engineer. Help him get to 50,000 subscribers. So congrats in advance on that, John. That's a pretty cool accomplishment. Um, thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Be sure to follow Hayden Clark. See you next time. Hayden and John. <laughs> <laughs>